earlier this week I was, I was speaking to a political journalist and, and I was telling about, about what was going on and said I must go to the office to sit and write and prepare. And he says, what are you writing about? And I says, well, the title is, is Westminster Parliamentary Democracy Fit for Purpose in the 21st Century? And the political journalist at Westminster laughed and he said, that would be quick. You're going to stand up, say no, and then sit back down again. Um, that's also been reflected on my Twitter feed this week as well when this has been advertised. But since brevity and politicians and politics don't mix, I'm afraid that you're going to have to bear with me for slightly longer than that. The conclusion will be the same. That shouldn't come as a great discussion at all. And I know that in these in academic circles, it's okay to announce your conclusion at the very start. But let me tell you why I've come to that conclusion. Um, first of all, it is a privilege to be the MP for the University of St Andrews. I love being the, the, the MP for, for, for here. Um, when I was first elected as an MP, and I always thought this would be the case, but I remember a much more experienced MP than, than me saying to me, when it's all crazy at Westminster, one of the best things that you'll get as being an MP is you will grow to love the constituency world. And I already loved it. You know, I live just outside of town. I enjoy being back home. But I think one thing that where the Westminster system, if you like, gets it right before I tear into it, is having that connection between your constituency and the work that you do gives you a perspective on things when you're removed from the Westminster bubble and you're back home. And I think that's particularly the case here with the university. Um, I think at the university, you take the long-term view of things and you take a more academic perspective on things where people are encouraged to have different views, hold different views, challenge one another. And also what's a real privilege to be able to speak to people is the expertise that you have in such a range of different issues. I remember not long after I was elected, um, sitting in a lab in the physics department, and I'm not a physicist in the slightest, but sitting in a lab in, in the physics department where black holes were being created there in lab conditions. Now, I'm well used to black holes, but I wasn't used to them being created in that way. I was, I was quite used to policy black holes, but not quite ones that I thought only existed in outer space. And in terms of that long-term perspective, I was also reminded of that when I hosted an event for the university a couple of years after being elected. Um, and then in reference to the independence debate, the, the principal um, got up and she spoke. And she, she said that, of course, the university had spent the first half of its existence in an independent Scotland, and then the second, second half where Scotland was part of the European Union, sorry, of the United Kingdom. And so the university almost has an exclusive and unique perspective on that particular debate as well. So the perspective that this bring, place brings is valuable. And I'm grateful to you all for coming along here. And I'm also looking forward to the questions that, that you have as well, because I often, I often get questions about things that I may not have thought about. Um, now, sitting in front of academics and students and others, there's also an enormous health warning, of course. My views are, of course, affected by my political beliefs, as they are for everybody in this room, whether we like it or not. There's also an additional health warning, which is perhaps unusually for the university and the Department of um, Constitutional Law, things are moving at such an alarming and dramatic rate that I, I hope what I say now is still relevant by the time that we get to questions. <laughs> I, know, I know this is not always a challenge that you face in this particular department, but I do hope that it's still current and relevant. Um, the same, I suppose, used to be said for the rules governing politics and the Constitution in the United Kingdom. And in the recent Supreme Court case over prorogation, I will make reference to this court case over the course of, of this lecture, there were reference to laws, in this case English laws, going back to 1362 in the reign of Edward III, and we heard regular references to precedent, precedent, which were referred to the English Civil War. So when you're looking back over this kind of period of time in reference to parliamentary protocol, you see just how quickly the rules of politics are changed. We're seeing developments in Westminster over days and weeks that in past times might have taken place over decades and centuries. The rules of politics are changing. I think this has been a long time coming. 
And I wonder, not perhaps in our lifetimes, but maybe in the time to come, I wonder if historians will, of course, look at these changes that are taking place very, very dramatically, and it will appear clear to them why it happened, as is so often the case with hindsight, that change had to happen. But I think change has had to happen. But it's been done so on almost a disorganised manner at the moment. Now, Brexiteers have often said that the European Union of 2019 is not the one that we joined in 1973. And I agree with very little that my Brexiteer colleagues have to say, but I think this is one area where we're in agreement. It has changed. But actually, the United Kingdom that joined the European Union is not the same United Kingdom that joined 40 years ago either. So what goes for the European Union must also go for the United Kingdom as well. And I feel that it's Parliament and Westminster politics that have failed to keep up with where the real politics in people's day-to-day -day lives is. Political institutions need to reflect the people they're created to represent, not the other way around. It's not for the people to keep up with the Westminster institutions or the other institutions, be they in Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, or Brussels for that matter. So change has been a long time coming, but I think recent developments have shown us just how unfit our Westminster parliamentary democracy is for purpose at the moment. Let's take first of all the electoral system. Now, Westminster is the only electoral system in the United Kingdom where we use first past the post exclusively. Scottish parliamentary, European, local authority elections all have different models that seek to make the result more proportionate and reflective of what the electorate actually wants. It's the last one to use this first past the post system with one member per constituency. I also say that as a, as a member of a party that benefited in recent times, although it was a new phenomenon for us to benefit from this particular system, that in 2015, the SNP, for example, received 50% of the vote, but 95% of the seats. Now, the SNP having 95% of the seats was not reflective of Scotland. It was not reflective of a, of a large and, and, and quite legitimate and thoughtful part of the population who believe in the Union, for example, or who believe that we would be better off outside the European Union, but that's the result that we got. At the last election, I got 32.9% um, of the vote to be elected as a one member, which, if you like, um, is not reflective of the entire constituency, but actually that's the percentage of the vote which some polls show would deliver Boris Johnson a majority of seats in Parliament on about a third of the vote. Now, there are many benefits between the first past the post system, such as the connection between the high politics of Westminster and the connection with often where you live and the communities that you represent. And I remember this firsthand at the time of the vote on military action in Syria, which was a big decision. I mean, never underestimate the, um, the, the emotional impact that that has on you when you're deciding whether or not to back military action or not, when you know that the impact <laughs> of your decision, if you, vote, if, you, if you decide to take military action, it has a direct consequence. And if you decide not to, it has a direct consequence as well. And I remember the, the days when we were when leading up to this, and I'd been part of a team drafting a report on whether or not we should take military action in the Foreign Affairs Committee, where I sit and I spent more time on the phone the day leading up to it on the proposed closure of the library in Pitt and Wien, because for people back home, that was the important and current issue. And do you know what? I don't think there's, that's necessarily a bad thing, that you should be there, most importantly for what people really believe in locally, as well as, if you like, the high politics of foreign affairs as well. You should be able to do both. And that is a good system. However, there are other models um, of the election system which deliver that, that aren't first past the post. The Scottish Parliament system, for example. Now, here in North East Fife, you have a range of different MSPs who are elected in a more proportionate way first past, on the um, first past the post system, but which is um, balanced with the regional list system as well, who are just as good at keeping their local connections and focusing in on local issues as they are in Scottish parliamentary issues, even with that 
balance. The other biggest argument has always been that first past the post delivered stable government. <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't think there are many of my colleagues, even from those from different political parties, who would reflect that we have delivered stable government <laughs> over the past couple of years. But interestingly, if you like, both in Cardiff and Edinburgh, we have stable government being delivered on a proportional vote system where it's supposedly no one party is meant to achieve a majority of the vote. So I think that that argument that delivers stable government has now gone. We're no longer in a situation whereby um, Labour and the Conservatives merely divide up the majority of the seats or, or the votes as happened in the 1950s and 1960s. It's worth reflecting, for example, that each of the constituent jurisdictions and nations of the United Kingdom deliver different leading parties. And at the next general election, it looks like that would be the same again. And even if the winning party does achieve a majority of the seats, as I said earlier on, that would be done on about a third of the votes that are cast, never mind the overall votes. So during this time of division, and there is unquestionably division, not just in Scotland, but across the United Kingdom, and high stakes, politics right now could not be higher stakes in terms of the impact of what, what we say now and it's, um, the determination of what happens in the future and for decades to come. I'm not sure that helps give the government of the day legitimacy with whatever plans happen to be. Anybody who thinks that this current debate around Brexit is simply going to go away on the 1st of November. It's for the birds of it's not going to happen. And it will continue to impact the politics of the United Kingdom across these islands, regardless of our own constitutional position for at least the next decade, and I would argue for decades to come. So some kind of change, I think, needs to take place. Also, the culture and rules at Westminster lend themselves to that winner-takes-all system. Now, we saw that most recently whereby, and it's, it's, this is a big change from, from, for example, the Scottish Parliament, where the government sets the agenda and has control of the order paper pretty much every single day, and also the wide-ranging prerogative powers that the Prime Minister has. One of the biggest arguments that my own party has deployed in terms of um, removing Boris Johnson from power, for example, is because of those wide-ranging prerogative powers that the Prime Minister has, which lends itself back to a day that when you win a majority of the seats, you then just govern without much um, recourse to the other political parties. Now, that works when a party has a large majority, but increasingly doesn't work where you have minority government. And I don't see at the moment a way in which you're not going to have at least some minority governments in the decades to come, in the electoral contests to come. I was part of the team that delivered what's been known as the Ben Act. And that was the, the, the act that took no deal off the table. So over the summer, a group of us from different political parties got together, there were about a dozen of us, and we tried to build bridges with each other because we felt that leaving the European Union with no deal wasn't a good idea. Now there are people on that, like me, who want to remain in the European Union, but there are others involved in that who want to leave the European Union but do so in an orderly manner with a deal. And we know that in Parliament there's no majority for no deal. The way we had to do that was first of all we secured something called the Standing Order 24 debate, which we had to get with the acquiescence of the Speaker, so at his discretion if you like, rather than Parliament. We then had to table the bill and get it through all of its stages in the House of Commons in one day on the 4th of September. Once that bill had cleared the Commons, we had to ensure a swift passage through the Lords on the 6th of September before prorogation, or the prorogation that never was, if you like, and royal assent, which we received on the 9th of September. Now, that was a convoluted means of government, relying on the powers that be in the Commons in the form of the Speaker, as well as lining up the powers that be in the House of Lords as well. Now, that process relied on ancient, and I'd say at times, 
questionable rules, and I say questionable, not to question them, but questionable in that nobody was quite sure about the process, um, at a time when clarity and key decision making could not be more important. <coughs> this system lends itself, if you like, to the electoral system whereby we elect a government rather than a parliament, but the reverse is true. When you elect me as your member of parliament, you are fundamentally electing me as an individual, albeit I assign myself, I'm a member of a political party. But overall, 650 different constituencies elect an individual who is accountable. I'm not accountable to my whips or my party leader. I'm accountable to my electorate. You're the boss, if you like. And as the Supreme Court commented in the prorogation case as well, the government exists because it has the confidence of the House of Commons. It has no democratic legitimacy <coughs> other than that. Now, whether you agree with that or not is not the point, but that's the set of circumstances in which we find ourselves. And that leads to another discussion around the House of Lords. Now, the House of Lords is maybe a broader ranging discussion for another day, but the upper house has no democratic accountability or legitimacy. It is now the second biggest legislator in terms of numbers after the National People's Congress of China. It's huge. Now, it is of course undemocratic given you've got people who are sitting in there by accident of birth or by dint of political patronage instead. Now, I think that's undemocratic, but even if you remove that, what it also does is that you have a second <coughs> chamber that lacks legitimacy. Now, a second chamber with some authority, and less dependent on the common, commons and the government of the day, could have been a really important part of this Brexit process. If it came to issues like EU nationals, where they had some concerns, research and development, and at a time when decision-making process and views in the lower house and the House of Commons are so polarised, there was a role that the House of Lords could have played. That has played a role, but because it lacks that legitimacy, it cannot play a stronger role. And I think that's something that really needs to be seriously considered as well. I think it's anti-democratic, but actually if you look at the end point of that, it also means it lacks legitimacy to do its job properly as well. If you are going to have a second chamber, you need to give it that legitimacy. I think it's an anomaly that needs to go. And then there's a point, and you won't be surprised at me for bringing this up, about what about Scotland and the devolution settlements. Now, something that is often forgotten at Westminster, but of course not forgotten where we are, is that the UK is not a unitary state. The UK is a multinational state with differing political priorities and even jurisdictions. Now, there is recognition and law for the multinational nature of the state, but that's not always reflected in the political processes at Westminster. <coughs> even the ideas of sovereignty, which after all has been at the heart of the Brexit debate, are different between Scotland and England. And in the case of McCormack versus the Lord Advocate in 1953, Lord President Cooper stated, the principle of the unlimited sovereignty of Parliament it is a distinctively English principle which has no counterpart in Scottish constitutional law. I went on to make the point, of course, that when you had the Union of Parliaments in 1707, <coughs> you couldn't just have taken on all of the characteristics of the English Parliament, which ceased to exist after that time, as did the Scottish Parliament, and you must have taken on some of the characteristics of the Scottish Parliament as well. So that's something that needs to be considered too. Now, the constitutional setup in Scotland is also different from elsewhere in Europe. And I'll come on to Europe in a moment, but even the Spanish Foreign Minister acknowledging that Scotland should join the EU if independence was gained in accordance with their internal regulations. The EU does not, of course, interfere in what's seen in internal matters, but does look at constitutional implications. Scotland is sovereign. And that was also reflected in the 1989 Claim of Right, which was drafted and signed by Labour and Liberal Democrat members of Parliament, as well as others as well, that stated in the Constitutional Convention, we gathered the Scottish Constitutional Convention to hereby acknowledge the sovereign right of the Scottish people to determine the form of government best suited to their needs. 
and that was backed up and in debate in the House of Commons in November 2018 when the motion was approved in the House of Commons, albeit without a vote. Now, that's been further embedded by devolution, whereby the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government have a distinctive method of governance with a distinctive set of politicians to hold to account and even moan about, depending on your point of view. But it is distinctive. And the Scottish Parliament sits at the heart of our national life in a way that was utterly unimaginable 40 years ago, but as a matter of fact now. It also deals directly with the European institutions. I was in Scotland House yesterday for meetings in Brussels and was told that I even that the, um, the salt tower is the only flag that flies on Rompong Schumann at the very heart of the EU district in Brussels. Now, all of these changes have taken place in recent years and we often take them for granted, but I have to say that these changes that have been <coughs> brought in are often met with indifference at Westminster, which is fine, they're not impacting, but we've also seen changes to the constitution with unforeseen circumstances, such as the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, when you can call a general election, or even bringing in English votes for English law, which I see on a first-hand basis calls, causes confusion almost every <coughs> time it's brought in because nobody seems to be quite sure where it should apply and how it should apply. And I think that's because we've not had a proper debate and discussion <coughs> about these. But we also have a situation whereby devolution and the way it fits in is not always recognised at Westminster. And one of the more disappointing developments in recent weeks, and believe me, there have been a few disappointing <coughs> developments, was when the UK government decided to withdraw official support from the First Ministers of Wales and Scotland <coughs> when they go to meet with counterparts in the European Union because, they said, they disagree with the UK government position. And that's the whole point of devolution, that at times we disagree with each other and at times different parts of the United Kingdom conduct their policies in a different way. Now, it won't make a huge difference you know, the First Minister is perfectly capable of finding her way around Brussels. But what it means is you do not have that interaction with the UK permanent representation when you can share your views, share your insights and share your intelligence. It should be done in a partnership. A partnership's not always about agreeing with each other. Sometimes it's about disagreeing with each other and taking a different perspective. And I think UPRE, the UK permanent representation, loses from that just as much as the Welsh Assembly Government or the Scottish Government does as well. Now, Brexit is obviously the elephant in the room. Um, politics, institutions and public opinion has shifted, but all too often, if you like, Westminster has not shifted with it. Now, we saw that again on devolution when you had the EU Withdrawal Act that fundamentally changed the relationship between Westminster and the devolved administrations with just 19 minutes of debate less than a minute for every year of devolution, with one speaker, who's an admittedly embarrassed looking David Liddington, no vote, and absolutely no say for the devolved administrations in the changes that took place. Now, in some ways, these changes and the big impacts having is most apparent <coughs> in Northern Ireland, and not just in terms of the border, which we all know about. But the Anglo-Irish agreement means that people do not need to choose between an Irish or British identity. And that's been a key part and often overlooked part of the peace process. And the consequences will be far reaching. What happens when we have hundreds of thousands of citizens who live in the United Kingdom but do not carry British passports? And critically, with Sinn Féin not taking their seats and the DU providing confidence and supply to the government, how do we ensure that Northern Ireland is in some way represented? The sole independent MP, the admirable Sylvia Herman for North Union, who's a, who's a unionist, does her best, but there's a huge gap in the political debate in Northern Ireland. Now, it's not for me to get involved in Northern Irish politics. It would be inadvisable for me to do so for a wide range of reasons. But it's also not something that we can afford to disregard or ignore. I just comment that Northern Ireland voted against leaving the EU. The majority of its voters were not, are not represented in Parliament. And recently, the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, I was part of an outreach meeting, and we went to Belfast and Armagh, and I have to say that anger and frustration was palpable. And the peace process is precious, and it's fragile, and people are angry. 
and also what views of the Scottish Government. Now, after the EU referendum, the First Minister put together a committee consisting of experts, because we, we still believe in experts, um, including academics, diplomats, a former European Court of Justice judge, as well as colleagues from other political parties. And they came up with a compromise offer, which could apply to the whole of the UK, and if not to Scotland, that Scotland should remain part of the single market and the customs union. That was endorsed by four out of five of the political parties that sit in the Scottish Parliament, but there was no engagement from the UK government on that compromise offer at the time. And I'm not sure where that leaves our devolved administrations and how they fit in. And we have a fundamental challenge, is that if we leave with no deal, we're leaving the European Union in the most extreme set of circumstances that we were told would not happen during the EU referendum. This is a fundamental challenge that MPs have. The referendum merely said whether or not the UK should remain a member of the European Union. It was very clear. So does this referendum now mean that we just, cut, that we just go with whatever the government happens to come up with? Should we have voted for Theresa May's deal with the damage the UK government itself warned would happen to our economy as a result of that deal? Should we have gone for a customs union single market deal as advocated by the Scottish Parliament and others? Or should we go for something else entirely, like a no deal Canada deal? There are a wide range of areas that we could have gone for. Furthermore, <coughs> who should we hold to account for promises made during the referendum such as those on extra spending for health or immigration powers coming to Scotland. Do they not count because they were made during a referendum rather than being made during an election? In which case, that calls into question how our democracy works. And it's a question that's almost impossible to answer when it's a winner-takes-all style of government. The promises that were made during the referendum will have a huge impact if they're not kept. Just in the same way that we as MPs hold governments to account for the manifesto commitments as well. That's all part of it. Now, Article 50 was touched on in the Supreme Court just judgment when it reflected any member state may decide to withdraw from the Union as in the European Union. And it quotes Article 50, which says, in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. But I'll be honest, I don't know what our constitutional requirements are, whereas they may be clearer in other member states. And then what about the question of independence? And you'd probably be surprised if I didn't bring this up. Now, during the independence referendum, Scots were told that the only way to protect Scotland's relationship with the EU was to vote no. Now, people like me contested that assumption um, but let's take that assumption that people like me thought that wasn't the case. Scotland is a normal sized EU member state that many, many of the IK and would be a net <coughs> contributor would have been in, and that's certainly the case of many politicians and opinion formers around Europe. However, what was really interesting on that was that without getting into that debate, that was seen as a positive, <coughs> if you like, membership of the European <coughs> Union was seen as a positive by unionist politicians who wanted to use it as an example of why we should remain, but also by yes campaigners like myself who wanted to use it as an example of why we could thrive. But critically, our membership of the EU was not seen as a net negative by either side. And that was of course reflected in the EU referendum when 62% of people in Scotland voted in favour of remaining. And according to every poll since, that number would go up should the referendum be held again. It's easy to see why. <clears throat> Locally, the university here, this, this is the biggest employer in my constituency by quite some distance. It's a big employer, it's a big investor, it's a big part of our life here, and a good part. And our relationship with the university is so important, and its relationship with the European Union is critical to jobs and to investment. If we look at the research and academic excellence at this university, freedom of movement, where we're able to attract and keep the brightest and the best and provide opportunities for our young people regardless of their contacts or income through areas that I benefited from like Erasmus or opportunities to train or work in other parts of the European Union. But even outside the, 
the university. We see the benefits in the food and drink industry. For example, um, produce that has landed in Pit and Weem this afternoon, as we speak, can be on restaurant tables in Brussels, Paris, or even Madrid tomorrow night. But this relationship with Europe is not a new phenomenon for Scotland. Our relationship with the rest of Europe has always been important. In those dark and unenlightened days before the University of St Andrews existed, should such a thing be easy to imagine, but even back in 1296, if any of you watched the film Braveheart, um, you will have noticed that there's a battle of Stirling Bridge where in the film there's no bridge. Um, and it's on a green field. But the first thing that we do know happened, the first thing that William Wallace did after that, was to write to the Hanseatic League, the EU of its day, if you like, to say that Scotland was once again open for business. Now that's history, and it's useful to reflect on our past, but the future is what we have to look to. And I'll also be clear that independence should never be a goal on its own. Political goals should be for the purpose of doing things better. And that's where we have the debate. How do we do things better? And I believe, and others disagree, um, I believe it will be a better means of governance, leading to better public services and well-being. But just as we shouldn't seek independence for emotional reasons, so too should the union, because the union is, if anything, a partnership, never presumed to exist ad, you know, into infinity because of an emotional attachment. Now, the Brexit vote changes everything. If you look around Europe, and a relationship with the EU changes everything, if you look around Europe and you see similar countries in terms of size and economy thriving as independent states within the EU, with our neighbours in Denmark and Ireland being excellent examples of that. And the EU has also changed things, providing a partnership of equals. And so it's a source of huge frustration to me when people equate being a member state of the EU with being part of the United Kingdom. Within the UK, there is no partnership of equals. There's no Council of Ministers. There's no European Court of Justice. No Commission. So be it on Brexit, Trident, the rights of our fellow citizens who happen to be EU nationals, or a Conservative government, we have to go along with what the biggest nation within the Union decides, except in the limited areas where those powers are devolved. And that uneven-handed nature of the relationship is also seen at Westminster, where whether we like it or not, the Scottish Parliament could be scrapped at the stroke of a pen. Independence, I would argue, is the new normal, and there are 27 other precedents of how independence can be determined and governed, whereas there's just one in terms of Brexit, and we're not even sure what that's going to be at the end of the day. It's also an independence where we should be defined not by our ethnicity. I thought one of the great tragedies of the EU referendum was the failure to give EU nationals a vote, those who in some ways are fellow citizens who have been most impacted by that decision. And I felt that it was right that my fellow citizens who have a different EU passport or were born in a different part of the United Kingdom should have a say on independence, but a Scot who lives in London and has made his or her home there should not, because this is about us as a nation regardless of where people comes from. And the stark contrast with, and I'm sorry to say, the heartbreaking way in which EU nationals have been treated over these past three and a half years could not be more different. And it is a heartbreaking way. These are our fellow citizens who have made their home here and have got as much right to live and work here as we do. But I'd also say this if we're looking at different governance for the future. There's also a positive for the United Kingdom. Brexit is doing, whether we like it or not, and I was hearing this in Brussels yesterday, Brexit is doing untold damage between the relationship between the United Kingdom and its closest neighbours in the rest of Europe. That'll take decades to overcome, it'll take decades to undo. I regret that. I've always wanted to see our neighbours in these islands enjoy a thriving and peaceful relationship with the rest of Europe, just as Dublin has done. <clears throat> now, Scotland could be an independent member state of the EU, and I think it would be instrumental in rebuilding bridges between London and Brussels. Yes, it would provide us with business opportunities and our close links across these islands, but it would benefit everybody by being in a place to rebuild those damaged relations, and they have been dam damaged, whether we like it or not. So, apart from that, what else needs to change? 
So our politics at Westminster is not fit for purpose, nor is a broader constitutional arrangement. And I think regardless of what happens to Scotland, and my views are clear on that, there have to be some major changes. <coughs> I think the debate over the past four years, we're now three and a half years on from the EU referendum, has shown the system of politics at Westminster is under unprecedented strain. Now, leave or remain, we're in for a decade of instability. So, what do we do? If we leave with the drastic changes that brings, or we remain, in which case we have to remember how to leave voters feel. And I actually feel with a lot of the disappointments of the Johnson Premiership, the lack of promises and promises not being kept and no clear plan, I can appreciate why leave voters are frustrated with what's happened over the past three and a half years. And it will have an impact on democratic institutions, particularly those south of the border. And I think that the case for a written constitution is now almost unanswerable, given what's gone on. You cannot continually rely on the courts. I'm a politician. I don't want to be going to the court. I want to be able to discuss and debate and reach a decision within Parliament. So there needs to be a proper breakdown of powers between the executive and the legislature, as well as a recognition of devolution and the other changes that have taken place as well. We shouldn't be in a position where less than a month before we are due to leave the European Union, that we've no idea what might happen or whether or not the Prime Minister might decide to break the law. And like it or not, the Ben Act is the law. It also could set out the powers of the Speaker, the opposition parties, give them a right for the business to be heard, increase the ability of backbench MPs or even the public to push for and bring about legislative or other changes. And again, similar leave voters can feel some injustice that we're now, only now debating what form of Brexit should take when that should have been set out before the vote. You set things out before a vote and you put them under scrutiny. That's uncomfortable for those of us seeking election, but actually it should be uncomfortable for those of us seeking election that we put ourselves to scrutiny. Similarly, the electoral system of Westminster also needs to change. <coughs> I don't think having a hung parliament or a minority government is always a bad thing. And in fact, the 2017 general election made Westminster that little bit more European. Minority government is something that is intensely common elsewhere in Europe. But it's also something that's common elsewhere in the United Kingdom as well. You can have minority government without everybody collapsing in a heap of indecision. And I'll even use the reference of in the Scottish Parliament, the SNP government, for the first time between 2007 and 2011, albeit in a different set of circumstances, with 47 out of 129 seats in that Parliament. Now, during that time, all sorts of legislation was passed because, and this is critical, it puts an onus on the governing party to talk in a meaningful way with the opposition parties, who reflect a proportion of the population, it also means that when the opposition challenge governments, they must do so in a more realistic and constructive manner because some of the areas in which they challenge the government may have a realistic opportunity of being enacted. And actually, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, no one party in any parliament has a monopoly of wisdom, has a monopoly on all of the good ideas. I was a special advisor for part of that parliament, and I found that actually opposition colleagues were coming up with some really good ideas. Would we have adopted them? I'd like to think so. But because it was a minority government and bringing on board everybody was a necessity of government, it made it much more likely. Let me reference one thing in particular. In 2009, the Scottish Parliament passed, um, what was at the time, climate change legislation, the Climate Change Act. That was world leading at the time. And actually, if you reflect, I wish we'd spent as much time talking about climate change these past four years as we have done on Brexit. But let me go back 10 years. At that time, world leading climate change, which meant changes, which meant difficult decisions, but they were passed unanimously, which meant every political party had buy-in to those changes and the difficult decisions that needed to be made. Similarly, there were more meaningful conversations going on with business, academics, NGOs, and other organizations as well. So there is hope in all of this. And I've been part of cross-party efforts, as I mentioned earlier on, that have seen legislation passed and agreements reached that none of us thought possible. 
the No Deal Act was one of the most significant Westminster Acts in recent weeks or even in recent times, and I was pleased to be part of that. Not everybody's pleased that I was part of it, but I was. <laughs> um, it showed that politicians with different opinions can work together. Now, believe me, I was as astonished as Philip Hammond was to find ourselves co-sponsoring a piece of constitutional <laughs> legislation. <laughs> um, but I think that was a good and a positive thing. But Westminster, as it stands, is not for, fit for purpose. Independence or remaining in the Union, leave or remain, we are facing up to a decade's worth of very, very significant challenges over the last decade. So my last point is this. If our political system is there to reflect the society it represents, and governs, Westminster no longer does that. And it's for the political institutions to change, not those who they represent to change instead. And if we are going to face up to this decade of instability and significant challenges, I think that's going to have to be done quite soon. Anyway, thank you, and thank you for your patience.